So anyway, let me start off here and uh, just to tell the general public here a little bit, the uh, beekeepers mostly know, but I started off as a young uh, man, five years old, I got my first hive my dad gave me, and uh, matter of fact, my mom took the picture, which Worcester County beekeepers put on the uh, front cover of the cookbook, and that's me at five years old with my first hive. And I can remember it was quite an experience because my dad said, you're going to shake the package of bees when it comes. And I was all excited. Then the day I got the uh, package of bees came in from the post office, back then it was all through the post office, I got in and I had a veil on, but in a t-shirt, my dad didn't wear a veil at all, and all of a sudden he said, you're going to shake your package. My dad had four packages he was going to shake after. So he said, what you're going to do is you're going to take this wooden flap, as the beekeepers know, off, and it very quickly, pull out that can of sugar syrup and then the queen. He said, you got to do it quick because they'll stop flying out. And then put the wooden flap on. So I'm, I'm looking at the bees and 10,000 bees in there. And, you know, I had hives. My dad had hives, but myself, I'd never done this. So all of a sudden, a five-year-old to shake 10,000 bees. So I, can, I still never forget the experience. Anybody that's done it, right? You, you never forget that first time. I remember five years old, I took the high tool right off the, the little uh, wooden flap, and then he said, you're going to with the high tool, pull out the can, and then get the queen and pull her out quick and put the wooden flap back on. So here I go, Dad, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. You can do it. He was a World War II, uh, over in Poland, and I uh, came over after the war, but, it was one of these tough guys. You can do it. It made me think I could do anything in the world, you know. And, but anyway, I did. I pulled it off, got the can out. He helped me a little with that can because it's tough to get out. And then I pulled the queen out, put it on, and I'm looking at the queen. And I see the queen. She's alive, but the work is in there. So he said, he instructed me all the way. He's my mentor, by the way. Uh, my dad was on sixth generation. Uh, I'm half Polish, half B. <laughs> and, and that's what I said. That's why they don't sting me. They, they say it's a bee whisperer, but you know it's half bee, and they know who I am. So I put the queen cage in, and then that moment that I'll never forget because I had a T-shirt on. You could see, short sleeve, five years old. He says you're going to give him a bang, and you're going to shake him right over the queen, right onto the. All right, on to the fives. So there it goes, my heart's beating through 10, and I stop, you know, and I'm, I'm shaking the knees, I'm, I'm shaking. How's that, Dad? He said, you gotta get them out of there. He said, you gotta get them all out of there. So here I am, and I never forget. My heart, put the close to my heart. My heart was beating through 10, I never forgot. That's why I choose one beekeeping family that I go out with every year. I do this for a purpose, you know, to see the reaction. And I went out last year with a, a, a family in South Grafton. It was uh, uh, the father, Jeff, mother, uh, Margie, the oldest girl, 11 years old, Nancy, Mark was nine, and little Luke was four years old. So I remember I went down to Uxbridge with them to get, get their packages. And I could see the five, they'd never seen a package of bees. I could see their eyes bulging because they hand and they're seeing 30 or 40 bees on the outside, the hitchhikers, when they shake them down there, some bees don't get in, so they stay with their bees here on the outside, so they're looking, and uh, so all of a sudden, Margie was the mom, she picks the hive up, but I could see going to her car, and she's like, like this, <laughs> you know, she was nervous, and so we got to their house there in South Grafton, and all the more excited. We're going to put the bee, little Luke, we're going to put the bees in? I said, yes. So I says, go ahead and get your suits on. So they, they go into the house, get their, their bee suit. Their mom, dad, Nancy, Mark, little Luke. Little Luke, four years old, you got to picture this. He's got this bag, it's like a bag on him. <laughs> and this big veil, he's got these gloves right up to here and, and, and then these boots and the taped up and 
We were walking out. They were writing on it. It was funny. There was Jeff. There was Margie. There was Nancy. Mark. I was in the back with little Luke. I'm, I'm going out there. How you doing, little Luke? <coughs> he says, I'm hot. I says, I know you're hot, but you have to have this suit on. He says, you know what we're going to name my queen? I says, no. What's your name you're going to give her? Matilda. <laughs> they, the kids, it's great. It's a family hobby. When I was started beekeeping, I started... I was with all old guys like I am now, white-haired guys, and I was this little guy. You know, went to the meetings and all these older beekeepers, all males. There, there's only two females that came out to the beehives with the males. The rest of the females were knitting. I should have brought some great pictures uh, from Paxton uh, of, of a meeting and what it looked like in 1954, 55. You, one picture of a woman, you see them all quilting. The kids playing over by the woman under the tree, and there's all these white-haired guys, and there I am, this little kid, you know. And, and so anyway, now these families has changed the scope. It's fantastic to see it because I went out with the family. His three kids, they they each did one side of the hive, you know, and painted it. So Nancy had one side, nice artistic work. Then there was uh, Mark. And yeah, I could tell it was not the quality of Nancy, and then there's a little Luke. And he said to me, he says, you know which side I did? <laughs> I said, I, um, and then I saw this green stem with a star with different colors. I says, is that yours? Yeah, how did you know that? And he didn't say anything to him. I said, I just guessed. So, so he was so excited. So anyway, we start, last, and this is the experience. I said, okay, who's going to do it, Jeff? Uh, and Jeff goes, Margie, why don't you do it? I'll watch the dog, make sure it don't get stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, uh, they went to our B school last year. The kids did, but Jeff and Margie did. And so anyway, to make a long story short here, Margie, she was the one who wanted to keep the bees. Jeff was talked into it. But anyway, she, I instructed her, and she... She's looking at that. I could see the eyes. She had a veil on her as soon as I said, don't worry, they can't sting you. They won't sting, but they won't get through that suit. So anyway, she, there, the kids are all watching. She takes the flap off. And then I says, and you got to do it very quick. Take that, and everybody, you all know how they can to get it out with the high tool. You, you know, she's struggling. She can't grasp it. And now I've got a magnet. I should. I got a, I put together, I had so many oh, ones, but then a handle with a magnet pulls them right up. The greatest oh, invention wow. this guy had, should, should sell it. But anyway, she finally got it out, took the queen. I said, now put the queen in, and then I said, you're going to bang it, and you're going to shake. And she says, how long? I said, to all the bees are up. <laughs> so just like me and my dad, what he did to me, there she goes. <laughs> She's shaking for about five minutes. How's that kid? There's 150 up in this corner. <laughs> How, how's that? There's two more over here. And, and I says, okay, that's good. I could have ended probably four minutes earlier, but you know, the excitement of it. And she put the thought, she says, you're right. My heart's beating through 10. You see her beating, bring that up. Because she, uh, she uh, I, I, every time I see her, I say, you want to shake some more packages this year? They're getting another hive, so they're going to be shaking one more package. So uh, they're going to name the, the kids all excited. At the end of the season, I went, I brought an extractor they borrowed, and I extracted, whole family was involved. You know, great, great beekeeping for, uh, so anyway, that's uh, how they start, that's how I started. That's how most beekeepers, that's all you know, except the, the general public, they don't know, but that's the hobby. And after that, you go into the bees, you go into the beehive once a week, you check for your queen. It's exciting, because I've been out with new beekeepers, and you check for the queen, you check to make sure they got enough sugar syrup, you check to make sure they got enough pollen in there, and it, you're so nervous. As first year beekeepers, you all experience that. I want to make sure everything's going right. I, oh, I think I'm doing, I, I go to see the new beekeepers. What am I doing wrong? Or, or, and then at the end, says, you think I'm going to get any honey? You think, I, I says, well, no, this year, just built up. Uh, how about one frame? 
I say, yeah, one frame you can spin out. You know, they love to have it at the end of the season, so you can give their friends their proud of, you know, the accomplishment that they worked with the bees. So that's that's kind of the hobby of it. And then I'll just talk a little bit of the uh, slide, but you know, for the people that are not beekeepers, it's just not the bees. Most people are the bees for pollination. That's a big one. They want because there's no wild bees around, by the way. Feral colonies are non-existent. They've died off. With poppy speaking, it's only 40%. They're losing 40%, 50%. Rhode Island, 60%. You know, Connecticut, 55%. We're all up in that range, so it's not sustainable. The wild colonies no longer exist. I knew hundreds of bee trees all over. And two years ago, my dad and I used to do bee lining. He's got, still got the bee lining kit. We'd bee line and find wild bees in the bee tree, and we'd go out there and, and get them. Now, I, I showed a couple of gentlemen, we are doing some bee lining uh, uh, over in Petersham, up in uh, Petersham, looking for where the gentleman is from Petersham, beekeeper. So we were doing some bee lining. Well, guess where we ended up in somebody's backyard? The bees were from a hive from somebody's yard. The wild bees are gone. Yeah, okay, Rich. What's bee lining? The what? What's bee lining? Bee lining, what you do is, is you put these, you've got these little boxes with glass, you put honey in there, and you watch where the bees come from, and you, you go to that point, another two in the same direction, 250 yards, 300 yards, and you see where those bees are going. You put another box and another box, and then you eventually beeline them to a tree. There's a whole, it's a whole method, but the, in, back in the days, that's how you forget your bees. The old timers would do beelining and get their, their hives out of wild bee trees. And that Paul and my dad learned from his grandfather. They did beelining all the time. Well, now there are no wild bee trees. Be, you're going to end up in somebody's yard. So the, the hobby is extended, though. It's not just the bees. A lot of people, the whole family don't want to all do bees, get into the hives, and that happens. Mom might want not want to do the hive, dad that wants to do the hive. So what you've got is many aspects to this. You know, you with the wax, candle making. So you can take the wax and make beautiful, my daughters used to make these for uh, for friends. You melt on the wax. Uh, you know, you can make all, with the senior centers, I roll candles. When I speak of senior centers, I got uh, little, cut little wax, and they love it. Little roll candles and, and the take home. You can, you know, uh, make big candles. This one I took four years ago now, but uh, we used to have a, one, I was melting wax. I always melt my wax. I was looking for something to pour in to make some candles that last a long time. So I found the guppy bowl on the t TV my wife had. I took the guppy out and put it in a honey jar. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for three days, when she got back, she didn't even know. Miss, she never saw the, that I had taken it. And there was the honey. Didn't find that. Came out with the candle. I says, looked at. I made find that candle can keep burning for like 20 hours. And you took my guppy bowl. I said, yeah, the, the guppy likes it in the honey jar. And she said, well, why are you going to get it out of there? I said, it's with a hammer. <laughs> so anyway, you've got the this. And for the new people here that don't know, never seen it, the fall is always the best time. Because that's when we evaluate whether we can take honey out of the hive. So for the people in non beekeepers here, you know, you, you go to your hive and you take out this beautiful frame behind there. This is Russian olive black locust honey. Right cap behind here. And I want you to try some of that after it's over on the table. It's my spring honey, that's black locust and, and uh, Russian olive. It's, a, it's one of the most wonderful blends of spring honey I've ever gotten on there, but uh, you can just smell the fragrance. And what you do is, as a family, like I went with Luke and and, uh, and uh, mom and dad and the girl and Mark, and we uncap, I assigned the duty. I said, Jeff, you're going to do the uncapping. So mom, he handed 
out of the super. Mom would give him this frame. Jeff would get a cap. He paid back because, you know, Margie had to shake the heart. My oldest daughter would hand the frames, take out the empty ones, and then I would pull, pull out the, uh, the frames, put them in a box, and then my younger daughter would be at the spigot. And because she was only three, four years old, she'd be the honey taster. <laughs> Dad, taste this one. And everyone's different. Your one batch is different from another. It's amazing, depending on where they're, they're seeking, but we blend them as spring honey around here. You need five, six acres of one crop to be able to get those specialized, those are all specialized honeys over there. 90% of one crop. But anyway, this is the fun part, and my older daughter finally got wise. She said, Dad, how come I can't be the taster? I want to be the taster. <laughs> and so we had to switch around, and then finally I says, Well, Mom and me have to be the tasters. Well, it's great to do it as a family now. We did then that part of it. But now they're into the highs with the little guys and the little girls, and the kids love it. It's a great family, and it keeps the family together doing something. And then for the general public, you can see this is what you end up with. And you give it back to the beast to refill. A refillable, hey, a refill. <laughs> and the bees do it. You know, amazing. So, so you can do that, and I, I want to get to the uh, thing, but you know, you can do things like trapping pollen, you know, and you enjoy it like this is live pollen. So pollen, that's a lot of people just for high protein, they use pollen. And then part of the pot, you know, cooking with honey, you've got, like this is raspberry honey jam. Have you ever tried strawberry, uh, uh, strawberry honey or raspberry honey? Oh, fantastic. Uh, the honey with strawberries like bread and butter. Just wonderful blend of honey and strawberries or raspberries. Apple butter, add honey to it. Gives it that little extra touch. And you can cook with it, you know, all kind of recipes. Yes, so cooking with honey, and then this craze of uh, now everybody's doing this. I think it's a waste of honey. But this is peach. There you go. Did you hear that from the state trooper? <laughs> honey peach meat. I had, I had a bottle of this at the uh, senior center in Northbridge, and I do, I put, out, I put out some samples of honey, and then at the, in the libraries, I can't give, you can't give out alcohol. But the senior center, they let me, so I poured these little cocktail cups, <laughs> a bunch of all there. So at the end of the presentation, a lot of people up here looking at everything, and the meat's over there, and I watch this one gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> Five. I had to tell the librarian, I said, oh, you know, you want to want to watch a gentleman not have, it's 15 percent, it's alcohol, so, uh, but anyway, this is just, uh, I wasn't in the library, it would be a whole sample of this one. So anyway, that's the hobby, it, it extends itself into a, many, many aspects, you know, so as a result, the people are getting in like crazy. Worcester County Bee School for the past five years has had 400 people in it, 400 people getting into the hobby of beekeeping. So anyway, bro, let's go to the uh, slides now. Before I uh, turn here, um, I'll tell you what time to turn. Uh, I've been at it a long, long time. I don't know. Uh, some of you may have seen this presentation, but for the general public, and then we'll go to the more in-depth bee stuff. Uh, I've been at it a long, long time, like I told you, going way back, and go ahead. And this picture here, you can see me here at the party of the seas with Moses. <laughs> see the bee veil? I was heading down to the Nile after to uh, work with my bees along the Nile, collecting lotus honey along the Nile River. But, and that's, by the way, King Touch Tomb, you've all heard about the urn with the honey, right? Two, uh, three years ago, now it's going to be, they decrystallized. There was a lottery. 4,700 beekeepers put their names in. Ten of them got to try a little bit of King Touch honey. Wow. Still good. Hmm. Still good. You know, there was two in the United States. It was worldwide, and they decrystallized 3,000-year-old honey. How good is that? You know, it don't spoil. No bacteria harvest. So anyway, go ahead. 
But then you can see, this is that picture on the book book I started, that was my first slide at five years old. <laughs> Go ahead. And this is, for the people that have never seen this, you look into a hive, it's scary. It's scary because at peak strength, there's a hundred, oh, you could have as much as, oh, 80, 80, yeah, 80,000 is probably the peak of uh, high bills to. 80,000 bees, each with two eyes looking up at you saying, who is this? Whoa. But you, on the other hand, if you're a new beekeeper, I see this with new beekeepers. They're a little nervous. They see this. Many bees, we take them. You know, people come out with me sometimes working in my house, and they see these booming eyes, and, and you know, they see me without a veil and without a, uh, uh, just a T-shirt, and they think they can do the same. I say, what you see being done here, do not try at home. <laughs> this is being done by a trained professional. But anyway, that's what you would see, that kind of hive. And they're all working as a team. I said to it's amazing. If you take the time, I hope all the beekeepers are doing that. When you take some time, just go in your hive. Because I see so much, why oh, they just check it and then put it. Take time, take a half hour, 35 minutes. Look, learn what they're doing. That's the, the fun part of this. And you see all the activity going on, and you see the little intricate things that are going on in the hive. It's just amazing. So go ahead. I put this in here uh, for the oh, beekeepers still here. In January, an average hive coming out through the winter has only got about 8,000 bees. So all you people, when it starts off brewery, it's only got about 8,000 bees in it. And now, here and most of the time in mid-January, it starts off, I'm part of the USDA study, the Harvard study when we track the temperatures of bees, when they started brewery, January 20, in the January 20th, the Harvard study and the USDA study was part of with the Asian Longhorn Beetle. It was part of two major studies. Uh, and both studies we looked at, we had on scales and temperature gauges in there, humidity gauge, and we were looking at that aspect of it, and we were doing brood counts to show. That's how I know what happens is early January, 8,000 bees. Matter of fact, on December 5th, we shook a package of bees, this is for beekeeper knowledge. Anyone who want to wager how much a hive of bees weighs in December before, as they go into the winter cluster? How many pounds? Seven to eight pounds. It's not like 80,000 bees. They scale down, we found. They're only about uh, 45, 50,000 uh, bees at most because we did find some nine and a half pounds, but the majority is seven to eight pounds times 3,500 bees. So most of them are much less than that. And they die off during the winter, and then January, 8,000 bees, and they stop building. Start with only this size brood, and they expand it. Then when they're about this big on one frame, they move over to the next frame, and to the next frame, and they expand this way. And they're usually in the upper box. And then what happens, we, we, we looked at this aspect of it. Once they go six across, frames of brood across, they move down to that bottom brood chamber in an inverted pyramid, and then they spread out and square it off. And that's the pattern that queens lay in during the cold weather. But anyway, they built the peak. By mid-May, they're at 80,000 bees. And then what happens? is that triggers a process called swarming, which we'll, we'll go along here further. But why do I have this shot here? Basically, it's one thing. Is <coughs> there's so many challenges today, so many things can go wrong, not only losing a queen, but I feel bad for the beekeeper starting off. Because when I was a beekeeper starting, the loss of a queen, the more America fiber, it was only two problems you had. Anybody that goes back to the 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s, you didn't have all the problems we have today. And some of the types of pesticides we have today, the neonic, neonics, the systemic, there's all kind of challenges. That's why the bees are dying. It's a combination of factors, um, including a mite. The beekeepers all know it, but the general public. There's a mite you might want to take a look at. It's like a little tick. So this, along with that new class of pesticides, Two, three different viruses now has come into the 
existence. This is all challenging the bees. And as a result of that, the bees are dying of alarming rates. The largest beekeeper in the United States this year had 110,000 bees. He lost 55,000 bees. Brent a D. 110,000 hives he has, and he lost 55,000. The second largest beekeeper out of the 75 or so thousand lost 36,000. I lost almost 40% of my bees. Kenneth, where are they at? Hmm? Where are they located? Well, all over the country. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter. Every, the losses are tremendous all over the world. It's not just the United States, by the way. China, the northern quarter of China, they've already lost all their bees up there because they have a use of pesticide along with the mites. They, Dr. Liu, who I worked on at Harvard, he's got film, northern quadrant of China, they're hand pollinating. Then, I should, I should stick a, that video in at some point to this program, but they're hand pollinating apple trees, it takes one person seven hours to pollinate an apple tree. Honeybees do only seven minutes. A good strong hive of honeybees, seven minutes. So where are we heading here? Food supplies, they're worried. That's why all the work going on at the universities, Harvard, Cornell, Penn State, they're all working on trying to find the answer and hope we can put it together and eventually come up with a solution. But this mite is certainly a big part of it, no question about it. The pesticides, the uh, viruses, and finally, we just, Mama Spivak from Minnesota just did a brilliant study. She found what's hurting is there's not the foraging that the bees used to be able to get of the wide variety of, it's like us with a balanced diet. They need a little of all different kind of pollens and nectars. They're not getting that. Used to be you'd have dandelions in your lawn, you'd have clover, now you get those $10,000 lawns, I call them. Not a weed. But that is something. So there's four or five major things going on, and hopefully before it's too late, we'll, we'll be able to find an answer. But anyway, this, this where it reaches peak, what else it builds to a peak in, in May? The apples, peaches, plums, apricots, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, all your vegetables, they stop flowering. So here in the northern latitudes, when the bees, bees are reaching their peak, so are the flowers. All the pollination that we get, is in about a couple of millions of years that both at the same time in the northern latitudes. I just want to read quickly this little passage. I love this beautiful passage. I'm thinking about rewriting a portion. Go to your fields and your gardens, and you shall learn that it is the pleasure of the bees to gather the honey of the flower. But it is also the pleasure of the flower to yield its honey to the bee. For to the bee, a flower is a fountain of life. And to the flower, a bee is a messenger of love. And to both, the bee and the flower, the giving and the receiving of pleasure is a need and an ecstasy. So be it in your pleasures, like the flowers and the bees. And you know what? Years ago, they didn't need man. The flower and the bee had a relationship, a loving relationship for millions of years. Now, I'm thinking about rewriting that passage and with it, third cog in that wheel. They need us. The wild bees are gone. We can, we're losing 40%, but at least we're surviving. Some of them are, are surviving. And that's the good thing. All right, go ahead with the uh, Probably, yeah. And for the new people, know this. Bees go about three, two to three miles in diameter, gather nectar pollen, and they come back to the hives. And there's a pheromone that they release and dances that they do to let the other bees know, I found a source of food. And so what they do is waggle dances. And again, it's something like this. I've watched many of waggle dances, and it looks <laughs> just like that. They waggle their butts. And then they do a figure eight to tell them how far and in what direction to fly. Amazing communication. Chemicals, compounds, and pheromones, they call them, and dances. Go ahead. They go from flower to flower, and go ahead. And in the hives, and again, I, the beekeepers all know this, but I, I have the general public here. Uh, the worker bees, they're the females. 
95% of all bees in that hive are females. They do all the work. They clean the hive, they, they go out and forage for the honey for the pollen, they go, uh, I should say nectar and the pollen, they go out, they, uh, they uh, also guard the hive. They do everything, the females. As a matter of fact, I said to my wife, I said, over a million years, what's happened? Why is why men have no more now? <laughs> and I said, yeah, right. <laughs> and then there's the male. The males are there for the purpose of pollen, uh, new queens. Queen is only good for two years, and they tend to supersede after two years. And so new queen emerges, guess what they need? The males, she gets mated by about 15 males, and is mated for the two to three years, and then she's no longer any good. They kill her off and they supersede her with another queen. That's the dynamics that are going on in this hive. There's a control group that decides the queen is going to be replaced. And through pheromones, it's all through pheromones, they make that decision. And so what happens is, like I say, the drones don't do anything. It's like a boys club. But in the fall, they kick all the drones up. And you see them in the grass, in the October, in the grass. They're trying to get back in. It's cold and that wet grass. And I say to my wife, look at the poor things trying to get in. The they are, and the workers won't let them, so that's the way I should be in the human <laughs> <laughs> She gets me back, you know, I always got to get back at me. And then the queen, the queen is the egg laying machine. Uh, Jeff, Pettis, Jeff Pettis and I trapped, or oh, Dr. Callahan and myself, we had to do brood counts. So we, we had to calculate how many eggs the queen is laying in a given day by measuring our patterns. We found a few of them up to as much as 1,800 eggs in a day. Imagine, just that queen just keeps laying. Take the opportunity, and most hives, you, you can see, when you've got a good strong hive, you look at that queen, she just keeps going. She don't stop, and she just puts her head in, makes sure the cell is polished, then lays the egg, moves on. And 24 hours a day, starting in mid-January till November, that's all she does is lay eggs. Because they're dying every six weeks. So it's a numbers game. And that's where a lot of people, new beekeepers particularly, they get a poor queen, they don't realize when the hive starts getting weaker and weaker, you've got to know sometimes the bees don't do it for a while. But you know, like when I go in the hive, I know right away this is a poor queen. I can tell by how many eggs and how, what kind of, how much brood is in that hive. So she, she's the light bulb. They protect it. And this is an interesting, photo, uh, we uh, I had a, a fellow teacher of mine that actually took these photos. This is with macro lens. But uh, isn't she a cutie? Look at those brown eyes. <laughs> brown hair. Sweet body. <laughs> <laughs> she, she is, she's a field bee. After two weeks, a bee goes out and they become a, a field bee after two weeks in the hive. But for the first two weeks, they're all house bees. They just clean, they polish the cells, they defend the hive, do everything, and in two weeks, they become field bees, go out and get nectar and pollen. So this field bee was out there, and to her honey stomach, she sucked up about 80 plants, nectar from 80 plants. And the honey stomach is the size of a water drop. You know what a drop of water is? That's what the honey, she keeps sucking up till she gets a water drop, and then flies back. And she does trip after trip from 4.30 in the morning in the summer to 9, 30, 9 o'clock at night. And she keeps going. Here's the house bees, never been out of the hive. They put their tongues together for efficiency. The, the house bee quickly sucks the nectar out into its honey stomach so a few bees can go out and get more. And this little bee, the house bee, then regurgitates the nectar into the cells. And what teamwork, huh? It's amazing. That's the kind of thing I like to watch in the hive. Just amazing to see that. Thing and you gradually want to see what they're doing. How did the team working as a team? Go ahead. And there's the guy bee at the entrance. They're there. They got this little gland, Mazinoff gland. And by the way, the bees, most beekeepers all know that. If you don't, they all smell the same in that hive. You know, we all smell differently. And and Jeff Pet, they got machines now that can detect that level of smell. That the pheromones. They now have a, been uh, able to pick up, not advanced yet, but another 10 years, you're going to be able to 
pick up with this machinery, what pheromones are being, it's just amazing the scientific stuff going on out there now. And so anyway, they got the hike, if a bumblebee tries to come in, they get it, go after it. And if a mouse comes in, they'll, they'll attack it and sting it to death. I was scraping last year, not this spring, but last spring, and a big clump of propolis. And all of a sudden, what the heck is that? And I noticed, and I said, oh, did I see the long tail? They, if, before I put in the mouse guard in the fall, a mouse got in there, got trapped, and apparently on the warmer days, the bees started moving and realized that mouse was there, didn't belong. And what I found, when I took that tail and that propolized mouse, all I saw was the eyes, the nose, and the face. <laughs> it was like that. Because they stung it to death in pain. And they'll sacrifice, they will sacrifice for the good of the hive. How many humans would do that? Sacrifice themselves for, you know. So, go ahead. And here's a house cleaning, bee cleaning out dead lava. Go ahead. Now, this is, most of you probably don't know this. Tom Seeley just discovered this. There's a group called Water Gathering Bees. They're called Water Gathering. That's all their job is. To gather water because in the hive, the house bees in the lava need water. Any creature needs water. The only way they're getting it is the bees bring it back. Well, there's a whole cast of bees. That's what they do, bring back water. You've seen it around your bird baths. Hot days, they go out there. They bring back so the house bees can drink, so the nurse bees can feed the lava water. And at the same time, if it's too hot and humid in there, they put the water droplets on the frames. Take a look on real hot, dry weather next time. You see these water droplets. And then they fan, evaporate the excess moisture. And by the way, this is amazing because the USDA scales proved it. The, when the brood starts, as soon as she starts laying in January, they bring the temperature up to 92 to 95, right in that range. If it gets colder than 92 degrees, the brood chills. In the more cool, in the 80s, low 80s, it doesn't take long for the brood to get a chill where they'll die. And then if it gets above 97, they'll suffocate. So they have to keep a balance and temperature. To me, that's the most amazing thing, the dynamics of keeping. I have a hard time keeping my house at 68 when it's 20 below. And those little things that got it at 93 degrees, you know, I say to my wife, I wonder to put 10 swans up in the attic and just see what it means. You know, it would save a lot of money. You just feed them honey. But the water gallons, go ahead. And here's just a close up I got because some great photography he did. Uh, a close up of a guy be here at the entrance. Go ahead. And here's the nurse piece. Watch these, you folks that are beekeepers. You tap the time, go in, you'll actually see them. They'll be, be with their mandibles. You'll see them. They're chewing. They're, there's a motion. Before they go down to feed, you'll see this mandibles like this. They're chewing the pollen and the nectar together and adding an enzyme from the hyperpharyngeal glands to help. And they're like this, and then they feed those larvae. And you see the head of the larva come up and take that food. Look closely. Bring a magnifying glass even. Take a magnifying glass. You can see it real clear. And or what they can do is put it at the bottom, and the larvae can take it themselves. And picture this. I never knew this, but each of these larvae are releasing a pheromone to the nurse bees. Feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. They're not saying anything, they're making any sounds, but the pheromone is saying, feed me, feed me. And every four hours they have to be fed. Until they're capped over. Those bees are, have to be fed. That's why it's important when they're raising the brood, they need two things, pollen and lava. Two things that they need to raise brood. Without one or two, not to raise brood, unless it's a poor queen we had. Uh, right here, uh, Chad, who's got a uh, uh, queen that's not laying. That if, after a while, if they got both and they're not laying, it's the queen, so you have to take action. But those nurse bees, imagine all these nurse bees, all these nurse bees trying to run around, feed all, feed me, feed me, feed me, and four hours later, feed me, feed me, feed me, and, and, and it has to be, I look at them, they're nuts. All these nurse bees are in the nest, go ahead. And go ahead, skip that one here. Yeah. Uh, this is the drone, I won't say any more about that. 
they're not there to open the hive. You don't want all drone hive because they fall apart, they, the hive dies out. That's called a drone, uh, drone laying queen does that and laying workers, as most of you know. Those are two situations for the beekeepers here. You don't want a land worker or a drone land. All you're going to get is boy bees. You know what happens to the hive? It just collapses. Die up because nobody does any work. They're all, they all stay in that hive. I've seen heavy drone hives, and they're all wandering around without any, any direction because the queen's not releasing any pheromones. They're scatterbrained. There's no direction from the queen with the pheromones. And so the poor, the poor guys, you know, go ahead. And there's the queen. Puts, you can see she's twice the size for the people that don't know her. Go ahead. And here she is. Most of us mark her so we can find it easy. I don't. I don't believe in it. But uh, anyway, you can see long abdomen. This is her court. They feed her. They groom her. They do everything. New researchers used to think that she just kept going and going. Now we know that three or four times on a day she goes into a transient state for rest and don't lay. That's only been discovered. Uh, in recent research. She just goes into a transient state, don't move. You've probably seen it in your eyes, but she's just not moving there. She's in a transient state. Uh, I never knew that until uh, two, maybe two years ago. Uh, uh, Keith, uh, uh, can't think of research down in Georgia, he came up with the fact that, uh, so, go ahead. But anyway, puts her head in. This is magnified by the old macro lens. Puts her head in, checks. If it's not clean in that cell, she moves out and the bees know to come back to clean that cell. Okay, go ahead. This photo, my buddy, who taught me, sold this to bee culture years, years ago. I took the queen out. The air coming out of the whole closet was the egg. Now, for the people that are beekeepers, you have to realize this is the size of a rice grain, but as thin as a thread of white thread. And what happens is it's hard to see them in yellow wax because, you know, looking it's hard. Even the beekeepers here, some of the beekeepers that are experienced, I said, turn it this way toward the sun. You can see it? Can you see the eggs? No. I said, turn it this way toward the sun a little bit and look down at an angle. Can you see it? No. I said, well, one more. Try flat like this and see if you can see it. And they said, no, I can't see them. I said, you need glasses. <laughs> You know, but that's, go ahead, next. There's the egg, and three days it hatches into a little baby larva and wants to eat. Feed me, feed me, go ahead. And there's the egg. There's the apple lens again. See how every cell, the egg lays straight down, and three days it falls flat and hatches into a larva. And that's when the nurse bees come into action. Feed me, feed me. And they have to just chew a pollen, chew up honey, go to get some honey in the top of the hive, Bring it down, chew the pollen, chew the uh, lava, make this bee bread with the hypopharyngeal glands. Some think, uh, a lot of researchers think that that uh, causes for a, a bee that's more, uh, um, a stronger, a stronger uh, something to do with the immune system. They don't know yet. Nobody's really discovered the full, and what that hypopharyngeal gland, what, you know, that uh, particular uh, compound does. Go ahead. But you can see, one day old, three days the egg is the one day old larva. Starts the one eight, here's four days. Go ahead. Here's five and six days. Next seven days it's going to be cat and it becomes a pupa. And for, by the way, I always teach when I teach at the B schools, look, make sure your larva and pupa are always crystalline white. You don't want colors, yellow, brown on them. Means they're sick with it. Something's wrong. They need to call for help. Go ahead. And in 21 days after, all of a sudden, this is miraculous. I hope all the beekeepers are taking the opportunity to spend 35 minutes to watch from the dot they make the first puncture. If you haven't, do it. Watch the 35 minutes that it takes. We did it with Jeff Patterson. He's the one that taught me this. Watch this, he had the frame right out there. We watched the whole process, 35 minutes. That little makes a little punch of eye, starts chewing away like a little chick, pecking its way out of the cell. Works so hard, chewing away that capping, and we're watching, and with new beekeepers, some of you know, because I've probably done it to you, uh, I see that when they're first new, the first year of beekeeping, I say, uh-oh, what's wrong? What's wrong? 
uh-oh, well, well, tell me what's wrong. I said, sure, I don't want to do brain damage. And so I take tweezers, I stop pulling away, and you see the struggle, go ahead. And you can see here, when it's two legs trying to pull so hard, you watch this process, how they do it. Then a little more, they got out halfway, it's, that's a tight cell that they're in, and they're pulling. You can see the movement back and forth to try to pull it way out. Finally, all sweated up and almost out. And at that point, well, what's, what's wrong? And all of a sudden, I say, go ahead. It's a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I have some say, how can you tell? <laughs> I said, it's a work of be foolish. Oh, that's right. They're thinking something else. How can I know it's a female? You know? And isn't she cute? Look at all sweated up, little brown eyes. And they all start coming to her and making contact with her. Go ahead. And that's the cycle they go through. Go ahead. And they go, once they get two weeks old, they're out there. It's not like saying, let's go pollinate for man, he needs food. They need the pollen and the nectar. That's why we got pollination, by the way. It's not because they said, let's help man, he needs food. They need, we help them by planting plants. That's why I encourage everybody now, help by planting pollinated friendly plants out there. In the fields, throw a seed out there, you know. Anything we can do to help the bees, because there's a lot of, that there's not enough of differences. Years ago, you'd have purple. We used to, you'd have all this stuff. We used to be able to keep 15 hives in one area. Now I can keep five or six. There's not enough forage for them. It, housing developments, metals cut down, you know, solar panels. And so what's happened? The bees don't have the foraging, and they need that balance to get the right vitamins, antioxidants, minerals. So we got to help them. Beekeepers, I share that with all of you. I, I've seen it, you know, and, and uh, I love the, the sign I, uh, I always see there in one gentleman's yard. He's got some, he's up in, uh, in uh, Ashford now. He's got, he's got a sign, excuse the weeds, I feed the bees. <laughs> and these people with these beautiful wands, they, they said, said to him, uh, what's his name, Angelo, Angelo, your dandelion fluffs are coming along into a yard. And he says, well, just brush them along to the next yard. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. Pollen, look at the pollen they bring back, all different colors. It's like a rainbow. I love to see the rainbow pollen in the, in the hives. And go ahead. And here, this particular one, again, with the USDA study, Jeff Pedersen and I at a micro scale. We took these pollen sacks off, this very big. And we weighed them. He jumped weighed them. The pollen sacks weighed more than the bees. It's like putting somebody on your back and weight and jumping off the ground, never mind flying back two miles. The aerodynamics are just phenomenal. You'll see them at the end of coming in with full pollen. They're lumbering in because they're just barely making it. And it's funny to watch them land it like, you know, on the landing boards. They're so heavy with pollen and with nectar in this honey stone. Go ahead. And you can see it, pack it in, because up here in the winter months, they can't get pollen. So they have to store, and, and a, a good hive should have about 8 to 10 pounds of pollen. That's the, the experts out there talking to Tom Seeley. Again, I used to call him a lot, Marla Spivak. Uh, we, I bring in the speaker, so I, as most of you know, I have the contacts, so I'll call the experts. How much, how much pollen? Eric Musson's the one that told me that. Uh, he said eight to ten pounds of pollen going into the winter months. And honey, eighty to a hundred pounds of honey. If you're not doing that, you're not fair to your bees. And by the way, honey is better than sugar syrup because it has nutrients. I never thought of that years ago, but I came to realize, wait a minute, what am I giving these bees? I'm taking too much honey, giving them sugar syrup, there's no nutrients. I think that's a lot of why we're hurting, we're hurting our bees. I, I really do. I think that's the other thing. We're putting them into winter with all the sugar syrup, no nutrients in them. And as a result of that, it's definitely, I've seen, in my lifetime, I've seen the big difference between beekeeping in the 50s and 60s and 70s and now. It's sad. It's sad to think that the bees, uh, all these challenges. We never had these mites. We never had a high beetle. 
We never had chart crude. We never had sap crude. All that came after the 70s. No Zimmer and American Farmer were the only two things we had that challenged the bees. Beekeeping was easy. Now it's a challenge. That's part of what makes it fun, though. Let's see if you can keep your bees alive. Isn't that? Folks here were saying, oh, all of my, three of my number four made it. Hey, one gentleman, who was it that had all three make it? Yeah, you know, we had three of, it makes you proud of it. I know I did. But now, we're all dependent on the challenges out there. Go ahead. And they need big fields. But it's no good, like just cranberry pollen, cranberry nectar. It's not good for the bees. They don't get that balanced diet. They're finding monoculture on the almonds out there. All they get is almond pollen because they cut everything down, just plain dirt under the almond groves. There's nothing else. So Jeff Pettis was out there for, for one whole season with the bees and studying that. And he found in those hives, all almond pollen. Wow. They're not getting a balanced diet. All right, go ahead. And here's the bringing the nectar, the house be putting the nectar in. They fan it all night at Dr. Pocino's in Sutton a couple of years back. The neighbor called Dr. Pocino where I keep my bees. She said, Dr. Pocino, I think there's a dead animal on the, under the, your friend's hives. And he called me up. He said, there's like a rotting smell. It smells like a dead animal. I said, uh, wait a minute. Is that night when there's a breeze going that way? He said, yeah. I said, tell them, don't worry. That's goldenrod nectar being fanned. They have to get 80% water out of the nectar. And as they fan it, beekeepers don't know. You stand in the evening when they're fanning, right? Have you ever? Mr. Boucher, he's, uh, what, three years now? Four years. Well, you can smell that coming. It's most honeys have a nice fragrance. Klepto, sweet pepper bush, has a beautiful fragrance. Golden rod, it smells like a dead animal. But the honey is delicious. You'll be able to taste it here after the golden rod honey. But it's awful. You think you wouldn't want to touch it, need it after smelling that fanning uh, motion. Go ahead. And then they cap it over like you saw in the frame that I showed you and seal it over for the winter months, 80 to 100 pounds. Go ahead. And they built the wax with the honey. They ooze the wax out and they shape it into these beautiful six sided geometric shapes. Everyone the same size. Mathematicians at their best. I often say, I watch them. You can watch when they chew them and build them. They get into a chain. They get into a long chain, and they're all along that chain where they're building. They build them all the same size, all six sided. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. She don't look too happy, does she? This is Sarah. <laughs> Sarah had to bring beagles, <coughs> resins, pine saps for the bees to make their propolis. You know why? Because now we know Miles Spivak spoke to us a couple. That helps the immune system. All these new discoveries are coming out. They coat the inside of the nest. And she said it's essential for their immune systems. And so we now know that I, I learned, I didn't really make the connection. My dad used to give us propolis to suck on when we had sore throats when we were kids. Right? And they went away. In Europe, they used them. I went to an apotherapy conference in, in down in Providence, three days. Doctors from Romania, from France, from Italy. They're all using propolis for medication over there. Tremendous amounts. They use in honey for a lot of medical things. We're starting to come back to it. We're seeing a movement toward that direction. For allergies, the people more and more want the local honey for the allergies. They ask for propolis now. So, but Sarah, that's, the bees don't like to bring that because they all have to pull that off of them. And I imagine it must hurt. You know what bee glue is. All you bee people know, right? How it's sticky and it's hot. It's like holes or hot. And when it's cold, it's like cement. You can't move the frames out because it's hardened. And they sealed everything in. They coated the inside. It's antibacterial. I now don't scrape out my, my house. Leave it there. Leave that coating because it's important for the bees, the immune system. Go ahead. 
And they, how do they plan? Look at how Ralph planned this. Was. This is a friend. Here's all the girl bees. You notice what they think of boy bees. <laughs> they go patch in each corner. <laughs> they put the pollen right up above, and the honey, they chew it up. The nurse bees can come right down and feed it. That's why you see that little motion. Watch in your hives. That chew, they, you see them taking the honey and then coming down. Go ahead. And then you got, most bees make more than they need the honey, so we can take it. We often uh, borrow, uh, I should say steal it, we never give it back. But anyway, that's what a beehive looks like. And go ahead, just a few more slides. Once a year, the way bees multiply for the people that aren't beekeepers is swarming. What they do is once a year, around May to June, they build five or six queen cells, about three to four inches long. They put a egg in there, and they feed it royal jelly. They put more of these enzymes from the hypopharyngeal glands, more pollen into their mixture. And it allows the queen's female organs to develop, for the ovaries to develop, and, and her spermatica, where she stores the sperm when she's mated by those 15 males for life, she stores, well, that allows those organs to develop, whereas the worker bees are all females, but they don't get the royal jelly, and as a result, their female organs never develop. They can lay eggs, but never be fertilized, and they can only produce drones. That's why you want to lay a worker bee or a, or a drone laying queen, because they can only lay on full legs, boy bees. All right, go ahead. And then, days before the old, the new queen's going to hatch out, the old queen takes half of the bees and forms a swarm. And go ahead. Uh, yellow jacket, this for the non beekeepers. Yellow jackets, oftentimes, the culprits, honeybees are blamed for because they're aggressive. Honeybees are very docile. And talking about a swarm here, I've only got two, two more pictures, but Somerville, last August, this past August, I told a story to the group in Princeton. I went, Char Charlie Wykus, who was a beekeeper, started last year. I get a call. That was August 14th, I think it was. Ken, can you come out here? He says, I, I got a major problem on my hands. Please come out here. I says, Charlie, what's wrong? We hung up the phone. I tried to call him back, no answer. I, I flew out down the Mass Pike. Luckily, a lot of state troopers have uh, honeybees now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I did. I did flew out because I thought the guy was dying. I got out there, got to his house, downtown Somerville. They have the pictures, all houses right next to each other. The main streets right there with all the businesses. So I get out. Charlie's house. He's almost crying. He says, "Ken, uh, I hope I hope I'm not in big trouble." He says, uh, "Well, I'm not going to get sued." So I go over, I start seeing this, across the street I see about 15, 20 people all looking at the house and there's these swarming bees all flying around trying to get into the screen door. And right away, there's, there's the family whose house it is. Well, what happened is mom and dad and the two boys were in the backyard in a swimming pool with the kids. Well, mom and the young one had enough, they came around they left the screen door open. Charlie, bees swarmed and were looking for a place to land. Well, guess what they did? Right into the kitchen on a globe fixture, a big round globe fixture. I went to maybe about 9 o'clock, put a step ladder, a white bucket. I sprayed them with sugar syrup, spread them down pretty good with sugar syrup. That way it wouldn't be able to fly a little trick for beekeepers when you get in swarms. I spread them pretty good, and they all cleaning off each other. And just with my bare hands, plop right into the bucket. So nicely, they fell right off that glass picture right in the bucket. I put the cover on. I said, thank you for the swarm. <laughs> and Mom says, that's all there is to it? I said, that's it. What you see being done here during our trying home, this is being done by a trained professional. <laughs> I never tried that. I never tried that. And so I said, no, you probably don't want it in the beginning. But I said to the child, Charlie thought he was going to get sued, people were going to get stung. He had all kind of visions of, of getting sued because it landed in their kitchen, the swamp. I said, Charlie, you didn't listen to the bee school that you've got to control swarms when you're in, in a city like that with houses all nearby. He says, oh, I won't let them swarm next year. But the good thing out of this, you know what? 
the, I said, take the two boys over, let them see the beast flying in and out, take dad over, give him some money. He did all that. This year, guess what? Dad and the two boys went to B-School, they're starting to be keeping them. I'm going to be going over shortly. They're getting the packages in May, and I'm going to be going, what a great, you know, they, he got so infatuated with the honeybees that they're going to start, instead of suing or worrying, they want to start their own hive. It's great. So go ahead. And this is my dad. He's my mentor. He taught me everything I know. Uh, couldn't ask six generations in a family. Like I said, half Polish, half B. Red colors, Polish colors. <laughs> go ahead. And here you can see me last year at a meeting at my house here. Yeah, I had dark one here back last year, now I'm like one. But 284 people showed up uh, to this meeting. My, my mother and my wife had planned for 100 people, spaghetti, meatball, salad. Uh, obviously, you can see it's 1983. But salad, spaghetti, meatballs, and dessert, strawberry shortcake. Or when they saw 284, we had the bus in from the American Legion. Were any of you Claude, were you at that meeting, the 1983 of mine? No. Uh, all of a sudden, they went to Shaw's, had to buy triple the amount of food, which we never expected, you know, 284 people, and they're cooking and prepared. But meanwhile, we did workshops for them with some experienced beekeepers, and uh, they got a good day's training at my house. Uh, one of the things I, I always say to beekeepers is take the time to study the bees. Most put a hive there, go and maybe once a week cook, make sure for the queen. Enjoy it. I was out on the 16th floor, the big apartment complex overlooking Boston Common. On the 16th floor, the only place I see bees flying down instead of up. And I'm looking downtown Boston, checking the bees, or out in the, there in a the, in the Berkshire, looking down at the river flowing below. It's peaceful to me. It's, it gives me such a calmness, a peace to see and study these bees and see the beauty of their society and how they work together and all the things that they do for the good of the colony. If only the human race could learn from bees, it would be a better race. But they're being threatened, so hopefully I leave a message that, you know, you can plant pollinated friendly plants, plant meadows, let the goldenrod, Joe Powie, milkweed all grow up. Instead of $10,000 lawn, put up a sign. It shoots the weeds, I feed the bees. Mm -hmm. And finally, become beekeepers. And, and obviously, we can help save the bees. Because they've been around for millions of years. I think if we give them some help, I think for sure we can save the bee population. Because if not, I'll tell you, right now 40% of our food is pollinated by our honeybees. And that little video in China is just a little example or what would have to happen if we lose our bees. That northern corner of China with Dr. Lu is from, you know, there are no bees. No bees. They're trying to reintroduce, but they, but the mites and the heavy use of pesticides that they were using there, that, that caused the problem. And finally, I say, you know, leave you with this last little story, Charlie, uh, Stash Park College in Blackstone, Obviously, no, from nobody here in Blackstone, there are a lot of people down that way. But six years ago, I got a call from his wife and his, his daughter. She was letting go of his waist. They had to put him into a nursing home. And I, they called me up. I went down and asked Stash, I would not go without his peace. He said, Ken, only you would know, because like you, when I was five years old, I started with bees. I don't want to leave my bees. So I went to the nursing home there in Grafton and asked them if they could put a hive. But because of liability, wouldn't let me. But I went to the farmer across the street. You have to pick in a field that was all clods and dirt. And he oh, absolutely, put the hive over there. Well, guess what? I went down to Charlie's, um, Stash, uh, Charlie Wykes and the other story, but uh, Stash McClovich. I went to the house. I said, Stash, guess what? I spoke to him in Polish. I'm fluent in Polish. So, Stash, guess what? We can take your hive. He gladly went. He gladly went. We brought his hive there. He said, you're going to take me out there? I said, as much as I can, Stash. I said, I'll try. And so for a year and a half, during the spring, summer, and fall, I'd go out there 
I could see when he saw me coming down the hall, that big full of smile he had, just knowing where he's going to see his bees. I'd get him in a wheelchair, and I can still remember, picture him, I had him in a wheelchair, he's 95 years old, and he's bouncing all his quads of grasses out of the wheelchair, <laughs> you know, and, but he didn't care, his eye was on that high with the corner. And he just kept looking at that. We'd get up there, want to get out. I said, no, no, no stuff, sit down. And I says, I'll hand you the frames, you check for me. Find the queen for me. So, so I always, always saw the queen, but I said, here, yeah, check this frame. And here she is, Ken, look, look. And he'd get all excited. I could see the excitement, the love. He watched for those bees, just like me. I, I, I just loved to be out there with my bees. You know, I went out a little bit today, the other warm day, and just for peace and relaxation and calmness. And so, Stash, for a year and a half, one week I couldn't go, he said, Ken, are you coming out? I said, Stash, I can't. You can't. He was, I could tell in his voice. A year and a half, the last time we went out there. And you have to understand, Stash, he, he loved life. He loved life. He was, full of energy when his younger days, I can rise on a little more when he was already adult, but week after week, and then at last time, going out there, I could see it wasn't the same. He said, Ken, I don't, can we talk? I don't have much time left on this earth, he says. I, are you going to live to 110, Dash? No, Ken, I haven't got much time on this earth. I'm worried about my bees. Would you take my bees and please keep my bees alive? Maybe someday I can be reunited with my bees. That's how much he loved the bees. I said, and I know it would be tough, but, you know, I said, I'll do my best. Two days later, Stash passed away. He left a beautiful letter in Polish. Thank you for doing what you did. I know you went out of your way. He says, take care of my bees, please. That's how he ended when they signed it. Stash and Paul in Polish. I read the last tears, my wife to tell you that tears in my eyes, and because I know what it meant to him, just like me. And you know what? I took that high, moved it to my self crafting site. It's high number six on the right side. I got a big red S on it. And Doug can tell you I got I got Doug and Dave Lucon and Mike Reed. Six six eight two seventy. He played with the Colts, professional football. He helps us take off the honey some years. He can lift three supers. I can lift one. I can lift two at most. But Mike said to us, hey, you old guys, you, you go into one or two supers, you'll never get done. I said, yeah, 39 years old and biceps like this. So he said, Ken, what's that big S? I said, you probably, in the five years now, they've been alive. And he said, what's the big S? I said, that's for Stash Perklovich. That was his high. I'm trying to keep it alive, but I'm sure he's looking down because five years, it's been alive. I really work hard at that particular high, but his love for bees, and that's myself. My ashes are going to be scattered. My wife knows with my bees. So, you know, it's a hobby. It's become a love. And um, with that, I'm going to want to Oh, you're going to do a raffle here and uh, before we go to tasting all the different honeys. Yeah.